good. How about yourself? Very good. Your friends make it to town. Very good. There they are. We're going to have our chicken for lunch today. They got lost on the way. Maybe get the place back. That's the way we think. We'll have the chicken for dinner.
may be seated in his presence. I knew that. I, I knew that. <laughs> but it didn't come 
<laughs> anyway, but if you want the whole window, that's $100. So it's $50 a pain. We are going to have some cake and stuff that you can mark them up next week. Uh, you can look around and see which one you want, and we'll put your name on it, okay? Um, what does he say? $50 or $100. Okay, that's done. Yesterday, we only took and cooked 300 halves, but we sold out, gang. Yeah. <laughs> we started uh, the drive through actually at 11 o'clock. We had 90 half chicken dinners that had not been sold. We sold them. It was about 1.30. We still had 10 to 12 dinners left. And we said, okay, we're not going to wait for these. So we'll sell them tomorrow at church. We didn't get a chance. Because <laughs> while we're cleaning up, we got phone calls. Did you have any chicken left? Absolutely. Come and get it. We sold it out. And we made just under $2,000 yesterday. For <laughs> so thank you all for supporting us. We want to say thank you to everybody who took part. There were so many people who, uh, who pulled that together from the, the folks who cooked outside and uh, the folks who worked in the kitchen and, and ran uh, wheels out the cars. It was really a collaborative effort. We want to thank everybody who helped us out in that. And we were glad to, to see them all sold. Amen. I had, uh, we had one call come in and they said, this is what this guy said, this is the best chicken dinner I have ever had. Eating. It's better than my favorite restaurant. They go to a barbecue. I won't mention the name. But uh, anyway, because ours is better. So. Oh. Hey, Lila, would you like to make another announcement? I just want to add to it. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but they went home. They were the first ones in line. They went home. They ate their chicken. They called. One of them, do you have any tickets left? Came back and picked up two more chickens. It wasn't too much later after they picked up the came up and said, do you still have any tickets left? They came back and bought four more. <laughs> <laughs> so see, it's a gift that keeps on giving. It's so cool. That's a good thing. Amen. We got great, great people who do this work, and they know what they're doing. Amen. <laughs> we always have a good time. It's hard work, but it's a good time. We thank God. All right, are there any other announcements that need to be made? Did we cover it? Next week, I just want to mention, next week we're, we're taking in one person is, is planning to join a church and can't be here, so we have seven that will be here and are going to be joining next week. We have two young ladies we're going to be baptizing. We're going to have a couple of testimonies. The preacher isn't preaching. We've got other people doing some, uh, some testimonies and sharing, so it's going to be a, a wonderful Sunday. And... You're invited to bring a covered dish with you to church, and we'll all share the meal afterwards. So it's going to be a just kind of a fun Sunday, and I think you'll have a real good time. But we encourage you to come and, and uh, support us next week, all right? Okay, let's stand together and sing three verses of the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'd like to invite you to join me for a time of prayer. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day. Thank you for the beauty of this season. We're grateful, Father, for the warmer temperatures and for the ability to get out and to do some things that we can't do in those winter months. And we thank you for the beauty of your creation. All that you have made speaks about your faithfulness and your goodness. Lord, we commit ourselves to you this day, and we ask for your Holy Spirit to be here guiding us and helping us as we worship you. We thank you, Lord, that you have been answering many prayers for many people, and we're grateful for those answers. And we still have folks who are on our heart. We are continuing to pray for our dear friend Eileen as she is in transition and coming home to you. We lift our dear friend uh, Bonnie Lovejoy to you and pray you will continue to heal her, Lord, and restore her in body. There are many on our prayer list that we're praying for. We want to pray for prodigals this morning who are far from you and need to come back to you. We pray for those who have never trusted in Christ, that this might be the day they might say yes to him and open their heart to receive him as Lord. We pray, Father, for our nation, and we pray that you would watch over all of our elected officials, our president, and other elected officials across our land. We pray that you will guide them, that you will watch over them, that you will direct all that happens in America. And, Father, we pray for better days ahead, even though we've been through a season which seems like it's been a difficult season. We pray that going forward that you will continue to help us and lead us. We thank you for this church and its witness in the community. We thank you for all of the things that we can do to make Christ known and all of the ways that we can raise funds and use those funds to further your kingdom. We pray, Father, that you will continue to lead us with wisdom and understanding and help us always to walk pleasing to you. And Father, as we ponder your word this morning, may your Holy Spirit quicken it to our hearts and help us to make any necessary adjustments that our walk and our life would be always pleasing to you. These things we pray in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, remembering the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And we're going to go right into the message this morning. And so today we are continuing our study in Colossians chapter 2, which is dealing with the subject of maturity or growth in Christ. Maybe you've heard the saying that says history repeats itself, and probably it's a good thing really because most people don't even listen the first time. That reminds me of that old hee-haw skit. How many of you are old enough to remember hee-haw on Saturday nights? Okay, that's a good old time. They did a skit where the ladies were all together, and they sang that song, and they said, you'll never hear one of us repeating gossip, so you better be sure and listen close the first time. And you know, speaking of maturity, there are few women who will admit their age. And even fewer men who will act theirs. <laughs> you may have heard the story about Ralph and Edna. Ralph and Edna were both patients in a mental hospital. One day while they were walking past the hospital swimming pool, Ralph suddenly jumped into the deep end and he sank right to the bottom of the pool. Well, Edna promptly jumped in to save him. She swam to the bottom of the pool and pulled him out. And when the head nurse director became aware of Edna's heroic act, she immediately ordered her to be discharged from the hospital since she now considered Edna to be mentally stable. When she went to tell Edna the news, she said, Edna, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is, you're being discharged since you were able to rationally respond to a crisis 
by jumping in and saving the life of the person you love. I have concluded that your act displays sound-mindedness. The bad news is that Ralph hung himself in the bathroom with his bathrobe belt right after you saved him. I am so sorry, Enda, but I'm afraid Ralph has died. Enda replied, he didn't hang himself, I put him there to dry. Now how soon can I go home? Now I share that story with you for just one reason. You see, church, when it comes to your spiritual growth, I don't want you to get hung up. I have entitled this message, A Foundation That You Can Build Upon. A Foundation You Can Build Upon. Verse 6 of Colossians chapter 2, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Now listen to me, church. Once you start with Jesus, you've got to stay with Jesus. Amen? When you say yes to Jesus Christ, you invariably turn your back to the world. You turn your back on the world's ways, on the world's system, and on a worldview that puts man at the center of the universe instead of putting God at the center of the universe. When you turn to Jesus Christ and surrender your life to him, it must be a total surrender. Having Jesus changes everything. In fact, Jesus himself described it this way in Luke chapter 9. He said, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And in Luke chapter 14, Jesus made this statement. He said, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. That church is why we have a chorus that says this, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none may join me, still I will follow. Though none may join me, still I will follow. Though none may join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world some kind of a plant whose roots go down into the soil to get nourishment. We're being told that the Christian needs to allow his spiritual roots to grow deep in the soil of God's Word and in the teachings of Jesus Christ. 
And probably the best illustration of this in the Bible comes from Psalm 1, the very first psalm, which really gives us a stark contrast between following Christ or, or following the world. Listen to Psalm chapter 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were a tree, and I'm not, but if I were, I want to be that tree. Amen? Planted where? Planted right along the riverbank. In other words, the nourishment never stops, but it is delivered to you continually by means of the river as it flows by. A picture of the Spirit of God flowing over the life of the believer, continually refreshing the believer, continually restoring the believer, continuing to speak about the love of God for you and the mercy of God and the forgiveness for sin. That is the life of the believer. It is in the riverbank. It is to be next to the river with the flow of God coming. Now, I like that idea of being continually nourished. It must be like winning a prize and getting free Domino's pizza delivered to your door for life. Can you imagine? <laughs> About 11 a.m., you just pick up the phone. You only have to push one button. Of course, I would have my speed dial. And you simply say, yep, it's me, it's Bill. I'm in the mood for buffalo chicken today, and I'd like some of that cheesy bread. Thank you very much. And it just gets delivered right to your door. Isn't that a nice thought? How many are ready to break for lunch? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but notice that the psalmist is not describing physical nourishment, although that's part of it. God does supply all of our needs. Amen. That's part of it. But he's really describing spiritual nourishment, spiritual food for our soul. How do we get it? It comes from being in the Word continually and allowing the Spirit of God to feed you with real nourishment for your soul, your inner man. Now that's the first illustration. The second illustration from verse 7 is of a building. A building. And the verse says, let your lives be built on him. And of course, Jesus gives us an illustration for this one, doesn't he? It comes from the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 7. And here's what Jesus said. He said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand, when the rains and floods come, and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. We've all known people who had no relationship with Christ, no strength to draw, no spiritual help. And when the crisis comes, we find that their life collapses very often. You see, the differences could not be more stark. If you follow Jesus, my friend, the world will laugh at you. The world will call you a fool. But in the end, all your needs will be met, and your life will be strong and stable and peaceful. But if you live a life without Jesus Christ, when the winds of adversity blow, and they blow in everybody's life, you will not have a foundation at that time that can support you. Jesus says that a life like that will end in devastation. And my friend, that is just a sad state of affairs, isn't it? 
But if we build our foundation on Jesus Christ, verse 7 of our text says that we will notice it overflow with thankfulness. I love that. Overflowing with thankfulness. Aren't thankful people just a joy to be around, aren't they? Thankful people. I'll take people who are grateful over people who are grumbling any day of the week. Amen? Verse number 8, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Now how many of you know that there's a whole lot of advice flowing, floating around out in the world, amen? Self-help books on every subject from weight loss to parenting and every topic under the sun, and let's not leave out religion. Lots of books on religion. That's a pretty big business too, isn't it? I have on my phone a song that I listen to from time to time. It's from an album uh, by a guy named Pat Terry. Pat Terry was a Christian writer, and he put some albums out there a few years back, and this particular song is entitled, I Feel Free. And this is what he said. I'm not a follower of Moses David. I don't sell candy for the Reverend Moon. I've never set a date for Christ returning, but I believe he's coming soon. I'm no disciple of Hare Krishna. Chants and dancing really ain't my thing. I'm not a student of the Book of Mormon. I'm just a servant of the coming King. And I'm born again, a son of the King, a child of the Master, of everything, and I feel free. I heard the word from Mary Baker Eddy. I'm feeling maybe she has missed her call. In all my search for truth and understanding, I never found it at the Kingdom Hall. I never turned my dial to Herbert Armstrong, but I still listen to the radio. I know for sure that Jesus came to visit, but he didn't come here in a UFO. Everybody's got their religion. Everybody's got their way. You know that old son of perdition, he only wants to lead us astray. I never met the guru, Maharaji. I'm not so sure I'd really want that thrill. Goodbye to transcendental meditation. I'm tired of listening to the same old spiel. I'm not a member of the local coven. I heard those jokers never saw the light. I never cared too much for Edgar Casey, Venus and Mars, they're all right tonight. And I'm born again, a son of the king, a child of the master of everything, and I feel free. I'd rather just be free, wouldn't you? Keep it simple, focus on Jesus, I'm good. John Wesley called himself a man of one book, and that book, he said, was the Bible. John Wesley was well-educated. He had one of the finest educations of his day. He was a student at Oxford University and brought up by a clergyman. And he was well-grounded in uh, the things educationally in the world, but, but well-grounded in the scripture. And when it came to gleaning spiritual truth, his statement was this. He said, if your experience contradicts what the scripture says, then throw your experience out. We go by the book. You know, church, truth can often be a fascinating thing, can it? How many are familiar with the song from the Wizard of Oz, Somewhere Over the Rainbow? What a beautiful song, isn't it? Did you know that Somewhere Over the Rainbow was written not about the mythical land of Oz, but about Israel, the homeland of the Jewish people? The lyrics were written by Yip. Harburg, the youngest of four children born to Russian Jewish immigrants. His real name was Isidore Hochberg. He grew up in a Yiddish-speaking Orthodox Jewish home 
in New York. And the song's music was written by Harold Arlen. Harold Arlen was a cantor's son, the one who leads the singing in the synagogue. His real name was Hyman Arlen, and his parents were from Lithuania. Well, together, Hochberg and Arlick wrote the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which was voted the 20th century's number one song by the Recording Industry Association of America and the National Endowment for the Arts. In writing that song, those two men reached deep into their immigrant Jewish consciousness. Their story was framed by the pogroms, which took place in Russia, the purging of the Jewish people, and by the Holocaust that was just about to begin. And they wrote an unforgettable melody that was set to near prophetic words. The one line says, and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Yes, the Bible is God's revelation to us of the truth. The prophecies written in its pages have come true, my friend, with remarkable and unmistakable accuracy. Only a God who sees the future could have revealed such intimate truths to us. There's a Peanuts cartoon that pictures Lucy and Linus looking out the window at a steady downpour of rain. Boy, says Lucy, look at it rain. What if it floods the whole world? It will never do that, Linus replies confidently. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is the rainbow. Oh, you've taken a great load off my mind, says Lucy with a relieved smile. Yes, said Linus, sound theology has a way of doing that. My friend, we can trust the teachings of Jesus Christ. You see, his words create a foundation that you can build your life Let's bow together, please, for prayer. Father, we're grateful that your love for this world is so immense that you would literally come here yourself in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he came and put on a body of flesh just like we wear. We truly are souls who are temporarily housed in a body of flesh, but one day we'll receive a new body, a body like his glorified body. But we thank you that you have come to reveal truth to us. And we know that all the things that our Savior taught and all of the things that the biblical writers spoke of and affirmed and all of the prophecies they gave which one by one by one by one have come true with exacting detail. It only reveals to us what we know in our hearts. That your word is true. And of all of the religions of this world, Christianity is not attempting to be arrogant but to only speak the truth when it says that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. Those were his own words. And it was Peter who affirmed those words in, under the inspiration of the Spirit when he said in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. And for all of those who have sought through the ages to discount the story of Christ, all of those who have sought 
with their attorney's minds and their lawyer's aptitude to discount him, to prove him wrong, to prove it a hoax, to show that it couldn't possibly be true. We thank you that one by one their arguments have all fallen flat. And those who truly sought in earnest to prove the story of Christ as a hoax have soon become followers bending their knee to the Son of the living God. And so, Father, may we never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and may we never tire of our desire to grow in grace, to become a mature and beautiful bride to the Savior. Help us in this work. And for any that may be listening this morning who have never given their heart to Jesus Christ, I promise you, you are standing outside of the mercy of God and you stand ready to be judged in the final day. God loves you and he sent his son to die for you. He paid the highest price that could be paid. And yet if you will ignore the salvation of your own soul, if you will put off God's offer of salvation, and God forbid you go out into eternity, you will never have opportunity again to get your heart right with God. Oh, my friend, let this be the day when you turn fully to Christ and say, Lord, Lord of heaven and earth, who laid your life down to save me, I will not harden my heart to you. But this day I open my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. You who have shown the greatest love that mankind will ever see. Come, forgive my sins, and be my Savior, and help me to live my life for you. Father, have your way in every heart this day, I pray. And may your church continue to grow into maturity and be a church alive, leading others to the good news of the Savior. We pray these things in his holy name. Amen. Our closing hymn is a song I love. It's a beautiful old hymn of the faith. And it says this, Blessed, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. What a glorious thing to have Christ in your heart. I trust that you do today. I want to open up this altar. If you're here and you're in trouble today, if you're going through a difficult time, if you're having a health issue, if you're having financial crisis, if you're struggling spiritually, if you're just going through a time of difficulty and you could use a prayer, you come forward. I'll meet you right here and I'll be happy to pray with you and this church will be praying for you also. But you feel free to come and bring your burdens to the Lord. He blesses those who pursue him. Amen? Let's stand and sing it together. Blessed assurance.
He gave his life for you. He delights in you. And he walks beside you as you live out this kingdom life in a world that needs the kingdom. Be faithful, be filled with his spirit, and honor and glorify the one who is coming in the clouds to take you home. And we will fly away. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.